Monsieur le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le directeur général de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, Monsieur le président du Conseil d'État de la République et canton de Genève, Monsieur le maire de la ville de Genève, Monsieur le l'ambassadeur de Suisse, représentant de la Suisse auprès de l'Office des organisations internationales à Genève. Excellences, mesdames et messieurs, chers amis, c'est un très grand plaisir que de vous accueillir ce soir pour une manifestation organisée en partenariat avec le Club diplomatique de Genève, représenté par l'ambassadeur Monceau, son vice-président, et par l'association des euh, accrédités euh, auprès de, des Nations Unies, que j'aurai l'occasion de dont j'aurai l'occasion de vous présenter la présidente euh, d'ici quelques minutes. Mais avant tout, j'aimerais donner la parole à Monsieur le Maire de la ville de Genève, Samy Canaan, qui va s'exprimer au nom des autorités suisses. Monsieur le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le directeur général de l'Office des Nations Unies à Genève, Monsieur l'ambassadeur de Suisse représentant pour les organisations internationales, Monsieur le président du Conseil d'État, Monsieur le vice-président du club diplomatique, Mesdames et Messieurs, Excellences et surtout chers amis de la démocratie et de la liberté d'expression et des médias. Aujourd'hui est une première, notamment par le fait que les autorités fédérales, cantonales et municipales ont décidé de s'unir en une seule allocution. Vous connaissez le programme Gender Champion. On a décidé d'inaugurer le programme Les Speeches Champions. Et il m'incombe l'honneur, et j'en suis très flatté, de pouvoir inaugurer cette série. Et je remercie mes collègues du canton et la Confédération. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure, also my honor, to address you these welcoming remarks in the name of the Swiss Federal, Cantonal, and Municipal Authorities of Geneva. Allow me to pay tribute to the tireless work of correspondents and media outlets across the world throughout all these years, an involvement which in many areas reports on what happens here in Geneva at the United Nations. I am fully aware of how essential your work is in order to report on the considerable density and intensity of international activity in our city, a city which is the world's beating heart of multilateral diplomacy today. The media, ladies and gentlemen, never was and never will be a mere product like others. Dans le flot incessant d'informations qui nous submerge désormais en permanence, il est fondamental que les médias puissent continuer à jouer leur rôle essentiel d'analyse, de mise en perspective, de recul nécessaire pour mieux appréhender, expliquer et comprendre l'évolution du monde qui nous entoure. Dans une période où il est de plus en plus difficile de distinguer le vrai du faux, où les médias sont particulièrement critiqués, menacés, voire attaqués, y compris dans l'intégrité physique des journalistes, il faut constamment rappeler l'importance pour le débat public et pour le système démocratique de pouvoir disposer de médias libres, diversifiés, audacieux et indépendants. Et il faut impérativement trouver des solutions pour qu'il en soit toujours ainsi. Allow me to congratulate you for your commitment and to thank you for the interest you have shown in all the international work which goes here in Geneva, and which we tend sometimes to underestimate this, has a direct impact across the world. Geneva is keen to emphasize its international vocation and its role as a city of peace and dialogue. We saw this first with the creation of the Red Cross a long time ago, but still very active and alive. And then with United Nations and European headquarters, which our city is so proud to be home to, and many international agencies and non-governmental organizations. Geneva has a great deal to thank the international community for, and all the women and men who make it such a renowned city, a city whose cultural diversity 
is undoubtedly one of its most outstanding features. This is why it is so important for me and for the authorities in general to thank you, the representatives of international media outlets, and to express our deepest gratitude. We are all aware of the key role you play in supporting Switzerland and Geneva in our joint effort to promote multilateral contacts and negotiations here in Geneva. Allow me, therefore, to thank UNCA for its many activities and for all the support and protection it provides journalists with, as well as the launch of two new international journalist prizes within its 70th anniversary celebrations. Later on, we'll discover who the first prize winners are. This is part of the essential support today's media needs, part of appreciating your hard work. On behalf of the federal, cantonal, and municipal authorities, I wish United Nations Correspondent Association, as well as everyone in its association and all its members, a wonderful anniversary. Thank you. J'aimerais à présent inviter Madame Nina Larson de venir sur scène en la remerciant de nous avoir associés à cette célébration d'un anniversaire qui compte pour votre organisation, anniversaire de jeunesse et d'avenir, j'en suis sûr. Dans cette maison, l'avenir des médias et le rôle vital des médias dans la démocratie est évidemment quelque chose qui nous tient très à cœur. Merci. So, um, I'd like to say thank you to Director Philippe Burin and to Mayor Sami Canon for your kind words of introduction. Uh, it's truly a great honor uh, to be here this evening representing the Geneva Association of United Nations Correspondence, or ACANU, on the occasion of its 70th anniversary. ACANU has been around now for almost as long as the United Nations itself, and our members have been at the forefront of covering some of the, uh, some of the most important and monumental events that have taken place here over the past seven decades. Um, so it's uh, great to see that so many people have come out to mark this event with us, although I do suspect that perhaps the great lineup that we have here this evening may account for the big turnout. Um, we're deeply honored to have the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, here this evening, uh, and that he'll be speaking on a very important topic, uh, press freedom and increasing attacks against journalists. Secretary General, we know that you have a very, very busy schedule during your short time here in Geneva, and we really do appreciate you taking the time to share, uh, share this evening with us. We're also very happy that we have uh, what I think will be a very interesting panel uh, with uh, the head of Reporters Without Borders, Christophe Deloire, um, Ms. Peggy Hicks of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and also uh, political science professor uh, David Sylvan of the Gra Graduate Institute, who will discuss the increasing hostility against the media and journalists and the impact this is having on press freedom around the world. I'm uh, hoping they can also share, share some thoughts on how we might be able to improve the situation. And finally, at the end of the evening, we're going to have the first ever ACNU Award Ceremony for two brand new international journalism prizes uh, meant to laud exceptional coverage of work done by the UN agencies and other international organizations based here in Geneva uh, on a wide range of issues from refugees to international trade, uh, to health, uh, to intellectual property rights and also uh, separately on human rights. I think our independent international jury has done a wonderful job of picking two very deserving pieces for the awards, and I look forward to introducing you to the amazing journalists and their work during the ceremony. And I know that you're all waiting for the Secretary General, so I'm not gonna take much more of your time, but I do want to say thank you to the Graduate Institute for hosting this event, uh, to the Club <coughs> Diplomatique de Genève for partnering with us on the organization, for support from the association uh, Agir, and uh, for uh, generous financial contributions from the uh, Swiss Confederation, the Republic and Canton of Geneva, and uh, the city of Geneva. So a big thank you to all of you, and thanks to everyone who's come out, and I will hand over now to Secretary General.
Monsieur le secrétaire général, c'est un honneur, mais c'est aussi et surtout un plaisir que de vous accueillir à Genève et en particulier dans cet institut. Nous vous connaissons tous. Vous êtes une personnalité très familière de, de notre milieu que vous avez marqué d'une empreinte très forte au cours des dix ans de votre fonction à la tête du Haut Commissariat, Haut Commissariat aux réfugiés. Nous nous sommes tous réjouis de votre élection au poste de secrétaire général des Nations Unies il y a un peu plus de deux ans, parce que nous pensions, à juste titre, que dans le monde difficile et de plus en plus difficile dans lequel nous vivons, vous apporteriez toutes les ressources de votre énergie, de votre intelligence et de votre autorité morale. Soyez-en remerciés. Vous avez la parole. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear journalists, all protocol observed. It is an honor and pleasure to be back here with all of you today to mark the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Association of United Nations Correspondents, ACANU. I congratulate you on reaching this milestone as an organization, and I wish you all the best for your future success. I see familiar faces today of journalists who covered humanitarian crises and refugee issues while I was working here in Geneva as High Commissioner for Refugees. Many appalling humanitarian crises and issues would never gain international attention without your work. I remember discussing the refugee situation in Europe with uh, some of you long before it reached its climax, for example. And I thank you for your consistent interest and engagement and for reporting the facts, even when those facts may have made some people uncomfortable. Some 70 years ago, most of the members of the ACANU came from the countries of the Global North, and most were men. The Cold War was in full swing. Around the world, democracies were the exception rather than the norm, and there were very few countries in which people were allowed to express themselves freely. 70 years on, the situation here at the Association of Correspondents at the United Nations more generally, and indeed around the world, is fortunately very different. ACANU itself is much more diverse. Decolonization, the end of the Cold War, and other developed developments have transformed the United Nations and the world we live in. And we have come a long way towards realizing freedom of expression and other fundamental freedoms. The right to access to information is entrenched in law in over 100 countries. But despite these advances, in recent years, Civic space has been shrinking worldwide at an alarming rate. In just over a decade, more than a thousand journalists have been killed while carrying out their indispensable work. And nine out of 10 cases are unresolved with no one held accountable. Last year alone, UNESCO reports that at least 99 journalists were killed. Many thousands more have been attacked harassed, detained, or imprisoned on spurious charges without due process. And this is outrageous, and this should not become the new normal. When journalists are targeted, societies as a whole pay a price. And I am deeply troubled by the growing number of attacks and the culture of impunity. No democracy is complete without press freedom nor can any society be fair and impartial without journalists who investigate wrongdoing and speak truth to the power. As the influential German intellectual Jürgen Habermas has said, a critical media that informs reliably and comments diligently is, essentially to, is essential to a functioning, a functioning public sphere. It stimulates and orients people's opinions while at the same time forcing the political system to adjust and to become more transparent. Journalism and the media are essential to peace, justice, sustainable development and human rights for all and to the work of the United Nations. Dear friends, during my 10 years as High Commissioner for Refugees, I saw for myself 
Many situations in which the rights of the most vulnerable were routinely trampled and the lives of women, children and men were viewed as bargaining chips at best and collateral damage at worst. Among the displaced and the desperate in war zones and refugee camps, I was deeply impressed by the work of two groups of people. Humanitarian workers, including my own staff at UNHCR, who provided help and protection to people in need, and journalists, who often worked alongside them to make sure people's stories were heard around the world. Unfortunately, as they work to protect others, both humanitarian works and workers and journalists put their lives on the line. Media workers go to the most dangerous places on earth to bring us important information, to give a voice to people who are being ignored and abused, and to hold the powerful to account. And like everyone here, I rely on the work of journalists on a daily basis to do my job. In the two years since I became Secretary General, the media has brought to light dramatic human suffering in conflict zones, major cases of corruption and nepotism, ethnic cleansing, premeditated sexual and gender-based violence, and more from every corner of the globe. In some cases, these reports were the basis for further investigations by independent observers and human rights reporters. But journalists are on the front lines, sounding the first alarm, questioning official accounts, looking into difficult and dangerous issues, and at their best, asking questions that demand an answer and telling truths that must be heard. In many cases, they risk their personal safety and freedom, and even their lives to do so. To single out just one example, I will remember Anja Nidringhaus, a photojournalist and member of this association, who was killed in Afghanistan in 2014 while covering the presidential, ele presidential election. I pay tribute to her and to all journalists and media professionals who have paid the ultimate price to keep us informed. According to UNESCO and press freedom organizations, the media has become significantly less free, free in recent years, including unprecedented threats to journalists and media outlets and attempts to control the media, strangely not only in authoritarian states, but also in democracies. Women journalists are often at greater risks of being targeted, including through online threats of sexual violence. The harassment, abuse, kidnapping, detention, and even torture of hundreds of journalists every year is unfortunately becoming the new normal. Press freedom organizations report that more than 250 journalists were imprisoned in 2018. And while the harassment of international journalists tends to garner attention, the vast majority of those detained and attacked are local journalists working in their own countries and communities. And the most dangerous subject for journalists to cover is not conflict. The number of journalists killed in combat or crossfire is low and falling. Most of the journalists and media workers killed, injured, and detained were covering politics, crime, corruption, and human rights. Those arrested and in prison often face charges of anti-state activity, while a growing number are accused of publishing false news. In the face of this sustained campaign of harassment, intimidation, and lack of accountability, we, the international community, cannot remain silent. The news that is suppressed, reports about corruption, conflicts of interest, illegal trafficking, and crimes and abuses of all kinds, is exactly the information the public needs to know. I call on governments and the international community to protect journalists and media workers and to create the conditions they need to do their essential work and to investigate and prosecute the perpetrators of attacks on them. I am personally committed to defending press freedom and the safety of journalists. And I will continue to express my deep concern about this issue to governments and leaders, both privately and in public, and to urge them to comply with their obligations. We need leaders to defend the free media and to counter disinformation. The United Nations General Assembly, the Security Council and the Human Rights Council have condemned attacks on journalists and expressed their support for media freedom through many different frameworks and processes. 
the United Nations plan of action on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity is our system-wide strategy to support the environment journalists need to perform their vital work. And the General Assembly has designated the 2nd of November as the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. I have mobilized a network of focal points throughout the UN system to propose specific steps to strengthen our efforts. UNESCO and the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations are stepping up their work in media and information literacy to help people with the knowledge and skills they need to detect disinformation, counter hate speech, and defend media freedom. Monitoring violence against journalists is another element of our work. It contributes to tracking freedom of expression and human rights violations more generally, and it is an important indicator for sustainable development. I applaud the efforts of your association and other civil society organizations that work to keep journalists safe, particularly through alert systems for those who travel to places where they fear for their safety. Mesdames et Messieurs, l'ère numérique offre aux journalistes des moyens nouveaux de diffuser des informations et des idées. Elle met à la disposition des journalistes de puissants outils d'analyse pour donner un nouvel éclairage sur les questions les plus diverses, depuis les politiques sociales jusqu'à la question des victimes civiles dans les conflits. Mais l'ère numérique est aussi la source de nouveaux défis pour le journalisme. Elle a détruit certains modèles économiques et fragilisé encore plus la situation des professionnels des médias. La désinformation est une stratégie qui a une longue histoire et des plateformes en ligne lui donnent des moyens nouveaux et imprévus de se réinventer. La désinformation a servi à fausser les campagnes électorales, à intimider et à réduire au silence ceux qui parlaient trop fort et à exacerber les tensions sociales et ethniques. Et les spécialistes nous préviennent que ce que n'est qu'un début, nous pouvons nous attendre à ce que la manipulation et l'exploitation d'informations par l'intelligence artificielle engendre des problèmes encore plus graves et plus nombreux. Nous devons nous montrer plus vigilants que jamais et nous devons trouver ensemble les moyens de mettre les outils numériques au service de la liberté d'expression et de lutter contre les manœuvres trompeuses et abusives. Au niveau des Nations unies, l'UNESCO a lancé un dialogue mondial sur l'impact de l'intelligence artificielle sur tous les domaines de la vie, y compris les médias, en vue de définir des règles déontologiques garantissant que cet outil sera utilisé pour le bien de l'humanité. Je voudrais terminer sur une note positive. La période de transition mondiale et de transformation numérique que nous traversons offre aussi des opportunités dans tous les domaines, y compris celui des médias. Un instrument fiable que mesure les grandes tendances internationales, le baromètre de confiance Edelman, a constaté dans le public un important regain d'intérêt pour l'information au cours de l'année dernière. Les consommateurs d'informations ont été de plus en plus nombreux à relayer et diffuser d'importants reportages. Cela montre à quel point le public estime et apprécie votre précieux travail. Il y a aussi des signes manifestes que le public commence à comprendre combien il importe de chercher des sources d'informations faisant autorité. Beaucoup de gens s'inquiètent de voir les fausses informations et autres infox utilisés comme une arme. Cette prise de conscience laisse espérer que la situation pourra se stabiliser après une période d'adaptation qui sera toujours difficile. Le public aura toujours besoin des informations et des analyses fiables fournies par des médias libres et pluriels. L'information est le meilleur moyen de prémunir contre les mensonges, les approximations, les fausses déclarations et les antagonismes montés de toutes pièces. Le travail des journalistes nous aide à analyser le monde qui nous entoure, à repérer les motifs qui animent les individus, les organisations et les institutions et à créer un consensus autour du bien commun. Le travail des journalistes et des professionnels des médias, votre travail, nous rappelle que la vérité ne meurt jamais et que notre attachement au droit fondamental qui est la liberté d'expression ne doit pas mourir, lui, non plus. Informer n'est pas un crime. 
nous devons tous ensemble nous tenir du côté du journaliste, de la vérité et de la justice. Je vous remercie. Un grand merci au secrétaire général pour sa belle allocution. Monsieur Guterres doit nous quitter et je vais l'accompagner pour qu'il ne se perde pas dans nos sous-sols. Et je passe la parole à Nina Larson pour qu'elle introduise et modère la table ronde. Permettez-moi de vous inviter une fois encore de remercier le secrétaire général des Nations Unies pour sa belle parole. That was wonderful. Could I ask the uh, participants in our next segment, the panel discussion, to please come up? Thank you. So, um, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone uh, to today's panel, which will also address the same topic as uh, the Secretary General was addressing um, on press freedom and attacks against journalists. Um, as uh, mentioned before, I'm Nina Larson, so the president of ACANU, and it's really an honor to be moderating a panel on such an important topic and with uh, such eminent guests. Um, so let me introduce everyone. We have uh, Ms. Peggy Hicks, and you have a very long title, so I'm going to read it here. Let's see. <laughs> Wait, I could say, Director of Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures, and the Right to Development Division at the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Perfect. Yes. And we also have Mr. Christophe Deloire, who's the Secretary General of Reporters Without Borders. And uh, we have political science professor David Sylvan uh, of the Graduate Institute. So thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I think the Secretary General really did uh, a great job of setting the scene for us and describing the dire situation that we find ourselves in. Um, I was going to go through some of the statistics here, but I think he actually covered pretty much everything. Um, so I think um, that I'm just going to, to dive in um, and I'd like to turn to the panel to ask you to maybe um, unpack some of these different elements um, that he, uh, he pointed out um, the, to analyze the perceived decline in press freedom and uh, also maybe come up with some ideas on, on how we, what we can do to reverse the trend. So uh, Peggy Hicks, I'd like to start with you. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, also just celebrated its 70th anniversary. And in Article 19, it states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Um, so from your perspective, how is the world doing right now in ensuring that that right is respected. And maybe you could say something also about the link between press freedom and uh, safety of journalists. If, if you have something. Thanks so much, and such a pleasure to be here, although I, I think I've learned the peril of, of uh, following your boss when your boss actually gives a, an amazing address that covers many of the points that you might want to bring in. Um, when we look at where we are today, I, I think the, the Secretary General did summarize it. We, we've seen this amazing arc of progress over that 70 years, but unfortunately, as he also pointed to very eloquently, um, the statistics, and Christoph, I'm sure, will come in with more, are incredibly discouraging for what we've seen in, in the past decade or so um, with all of the various indicators of uh, that look at the global state of, of civil society generally and on threats to journalists in particular, showing a, a marked uh, decline in civic space at least and, and continuing level of, of, of very serious threats to journalists. 
And of course, one of the phenomenon that's, that's really important for us to look at in this context is the extent to which um, we have a whole new world of, of threats in terms of how some of these things happen online as opposed to offline. So I think we're, we're at a place where we've seen quite a, you know, a, a, a bit of a discouraging trend and, and looking at it globally in terms of how these issues link up with attacks on human rights defenders broadly defined. Um, we see a, you know, a very serious uh, concern and, and one that unfortunately the mechanisms and systems in place uh, simply don't seem to be pushing back this, this growing tide as we'd like to see. Thank you, uh, Peggy. So um, I was wondering also, uh, Christophe Delois, um, you, um, there were a lot of statistics mentioned uh, during the Secretary General's speech, but I uh, suspect that you can also paint a pretty uh, good picture of the situation facing journalists um, on the ground. So uh, maybe you could just uh, paint that picture for us first to start with. Thanks. I think that everybody knows how dangerous uh, this job has become in a lot of countries and even in Europe. And Europe is from far the best continent for press freedom. But even on this continent, uh, journalists have been killed in the course of their jobs because, as the uh, Secretary General said, they investigate politics, tax evasion, corruption, etc. In fact, I would like to start with, not, not with journalism, not with us as journalists, but with all of us as human beings and with what we have in common. And what we have in common, and what is really a common good for us, is the square of our village. The square of our village where we exchange ideas, opinions, where we communicate, where we exchange info news and information. And in the history of democracy, and there is a statistics about democracy, that the number of democracies have been multiplied by four between 1948, the year the Universal Declaration was adopted, and the year 2000. And after 2000, it started to decline. And the way our square was managed also declined. And there is a, um, a link between the two. In fact, on the global square of the village, because we now live in a global village, there are many new challenges. All challenges. There are prisons, visible prisons, with bars, with walls, and uh, the Secretary General quoted figures on it. There are, according to our figures, right now, 350 journalists in jail in the world for doing their jobs. There are also journalists killed on this square that we have in common. But there are also invisible prisons. The control of news and information through oligarchs who go buying in the media just to control the media outlets. The control through technology or through laws which could could seem very soft. There is no visible victim, no blood, no people in jail, but the information can be controlled. And there is another aspect, the third aspect. This square is becoming like a jungle. After the adoption of the Human Rights Declaration, guarantees were established on a national level, on national squares, through constitutional guarantees, media laws, totally invisible for the public, but with many virtues, and also through self-regulation, for instance, journalistic ethics. And those guarantees are swept away in the current world with the globalization and digitalization of our information and communication space. There are a lot of things that are much better about communication between human beings. Some dominations were suppressed, but also the guarantees were suppressed. And uh, former balances, legal balances, uh, the distinction between public space 
and private space, the distinction between advertising and journalism worthy of this name, all those distinctions have swept away. So the question now is how in our current world, in, our, in the state of our square of the village, do we rebuild a system of guarantees? And very shortly, uh, my organization, Reporters Without Borders, launched three initiatives trying to answer those three questions. First, for the protection of journalists, we do need a, a concrete mechanism for the implementation of international law. There were some progress in the past few years, uh, the Secretary General mentioned it, but we have to go really uh, more far away. Second, we have to find market solutions to really give incentives to those who collect and spread news and information in an independent and honest way. That's the Journalism Trust Initiative. And third, we delegated as consumers, all of us, we accepted it, but we never said anything as, as citizens. We delegated the management of the public square to platforms without setting any obligations. We have to impose democratic obligations, and that's what we uh, have started to do uh, with the information and democracy process on a basis of a declaration that was adopted by the civil society, by Nobel Peace laureates, journalists, specialists of new technologies. Heads of government and state have committed last November to sign a pledge on this this year, and we are working now on it. So in any case, uh, it's important to know what happens, but, but more important is to find concrete solutions to address the challenges of our times. Thank you very much. And um, so, uh, uh, Professor Sylvan, I was hoping that you could maybe say something. I mean, we're hearing about physical attacks and uh, journalists in prison, um, but uh, what can explain this uh, deteriorating situation and uh, the increased vilification of journalists? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess what I would try to do is to put this in a bit of perspective and let me, let me steal um, some terms from my colleagues who are economists and talk about the, uh, uh, the supply and the demand for restrictions on press freedom. Um, so that there's a lot more means now than have ever been in the past for to restrict press freedom. If you go back several hundred years, you find, of course, um, journalists and, and publishers imprisoned or killed, as now. Um, you find lots of censorship. You find different types of, of extremely severe restrictions in many, plenty parts of the world. Um, more recently, uh, you find all kinds of false flag operations, subordination, and ways in which uh, different kinds of state entities can present themselves as if they were independent journalists. And more recently still, there's different kinds of swamping type of phenomena in which the, the, um, there are so many alternatives, fake or otherwise, quote unquote, uh, to, to regular news media, that um, the, the problem now for many journalists is just to try to distinguish what they're doing from the hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of things that appear similar but are not. So on the one hand, there's many more means, quite apart from physical violence, of restricting or otherwise really um, uh, putting in sharp restrictions on press freedom. But also, there's a much greater demand for this. Um, anyone who studies the media will tell you that um, it's only in the 19th century, the later 19th century, with the rise of mass literacy, that you begin to get something like um, a popular press because until then it couldn't survive. There was no economic basis for it. It's only also even later in the late 19th, early 20th century that you have the rise of, of norms about objective, quote unquote, uh, journalism um, and the, 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 the movement away from some type of, of, of partisan press. Um, and uh, more recently, one of the things that you've gotten now with the rise of the internet that the Secretary General referred to is that there's enormous dissemination of this. And finally, there are more and more, with the rise of populism, there's more and more groups 
that will find not just criminal groups and not just businesses and so forth, they will find that their particular ox is being gored. And so you put these two trends together and you have an increasing supply of threats to press freedom and increasing demand for, 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 for that supply to actually be acted on. And, and I would, would finish simply by saying that the, the reason I'm, I'm quite pessimistic is that many of the calls that one hears, not, not all the ones, for example, the ones you just had a few minutes ago, but many of the calls are, in my view, contradictory because they actually call upon state authorities to act to enforce international law or to enforce certain kinds of norms. And it's these state authorities that either engage in this behavior in the first place or at the very least enable the behavior. And so if there's to be some way of starting to inflect those curves, the supply and the demand curve, it seems to me that we have to try to actually think of alternative means of proceeding. Great, thank you. Um, I think uh, sort of touched on a bit um, the whole uh, fake news uh, aspect of things here. Uh, how much um, do you see that, do you see fake news as an actual problem of actual fake information willfully being disseminated by journalists and uh, professional journalists and news organizations? And how much is it uh, just a weapon being wielded against people uh, reporting um, unpopular or inconvenient <coughs> facts? I don't know who would like to answer. Yep. I'm happy to jump in. Um, I, I mean, I think, and, and uh, our friends at Facebook emphasized this to me, that, that the issue is, is not as, as broadly the fake information issue as it is the, the point that, that the professor has made about the purveyors of information and, and the lack of province on who is giving the information and what their credibility is that, that creates the biggest challenge for us in terms of the media space. And, and to me, that takes us back to the point that Christoph made about you know, where we currently stand. And, and I do want to, to shape the comments to look at both what are the opportunities and the threats from this new environment. It's a very bleak picture that the three of us have painted so far. And I do think that for, for those of us in the human rights field, we see the connections both to the closing of civic space and to attacks on journalists, but also how these new means are also potentially part of our salvation, how they can give us more space to do our jobs more effectively as well. And you only have to look at the power of the woman with a cell phone um, who's now uh, getting asylum in Canada to recognize that a global story can be made so easily now of, of you know, one piece of information. Um, so you know, we do have to balance that, that broader, whoops, sorry, that broader network of information with what the possibilities are now um, and those new threats that we've talked about. And so for me, the greatest challenge is that, as, as I think both of the other speakers have said, we really don't know how to address some of those threats as successfully as we need to. And I take up Christoph's point about the fact that the mechanisms we currently have are not really well tailored to this current to this environment. And when we look at the way the platforms, for example, are dealing with online content, I'd agree entirely that we need to, to find new ways to regulate and new ways to look at this space. But we also, of course, from a human rights perspective, have to be really wary of the fact that those methods of regulation can't themselves close off freedom of expression. And the, the real risk here is that we're seeing governments using the same way we've seen counterterrorism laws being used pretextually to violate rights. We also see the prospects for regulation of speech here in this environment uh, going after online content and fake news in ways that will ultimately close down some of the space for journalists and others to do their work. The question is, I think, how can we promote trustworthy news and information? In the previous world, it was really important, and it remains very important, of course, to strengthen um, the ethics of journalists, because they had a sort of monopoly to spread news and information. And uh, the charters that were published by unions, and we have Anthony Belanger, the head of IFJ, here with us, um, are very important in this perspective. But we have a new challenge today, as citizens, is that 
quality journalism, sponsored information, advertising, state propaganda, remorse, are for the first time in the history of democracy in direct competition. And this direct competition, in fact, gives a very concrete advantage to despotic regimes as compared with democratic models, because despotic regimes can control their population, export their information under control, and they do not import other informations. And it also gives an advantage to information that are not only not verified, but that are more related with aid or really false information. It's due to the cognitive biases of human beings and the way algorithms work. So we have to set up not only a fair competition, but even a promotion of trustworthy news and information without entering in, into logics of censorship, of course. And neither governments nor platforms are legitimate to say who is honest and who is not. So we have to find other ways through norms and institutions, but we have to create this new system, and that's uh, what we are trying to do. Because otherwise, nowadays, who dictates the norms? Who creates the architecture of the square? Who says where we can put the tables and the chairs? Mark Zuckerberg on one side, and Xi Jinping on the other side. <laughs> Not really. Today, they create, they manage the space. For the moment, we can consider that Xi Jinping does it only for China. But if we have a closer look, he is trying to export his model. And what will we have in democracies to say to those platforms, to Chinese platforms, the, the fact that they are Chinese is, is not a problem. The fact that they are in direct connection to the Communist Party of China is a problem. What will we have to say? Just, this is a market, this is competition, this is pluralism? No, it isn't. It is even the contrary of pluralism. So we have to find really concrete ways and, and not only to consider that journalism or beyond journalism, trustworthy news and information is composed by, just by freedom. Even journalism, it's a mix of freedom and duties, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Sylvan, did you have anything to add to well, that? The, the, the only thing that I, that I would add is that the, the traditional model that we have for a number of decades in many countries of the, of the media, uh, particularly of newspapers, but more recently of other forms of, of uh, media that, through which journalists are, are able to convey their work, is something that, as everyone here knows much better than, than I do, is, uh, is rapidly going out of business. Uh, and I use that term quite, quite deliberately. So that in the old days, it was possible to get newspaper stories that were basically paid for by advertising. And this was a model that worked very well because you had a relatively captive market. You had people would read the newspaper every day for entertainment purposes. And so on the one hand, you had that model. And on the other hand, you had incentives in terms of scoops and in terms of actually breaking news f to, to break stories that one knew that politicians or counter elites would actually take up and, 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 and run with. Both of those conditions are, are really fading. Um, Again, I'm sure Christoph can say much more than I could about the incredible devastation that's been wreaked on the standard idea of a, of a local newspaper. Um, and this has been going on for decades. There's nothing new about this. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But it's also been wreaked by the fact that we have in a number of countries, and in fact, I, if I think about it, I can think of dozens of countries, a rise in a kind of tribalism in which therefore the, the kind of norms that elites had that certain things are so scandalous that they have to actually be criticized and that one, one would stand for office on that basis, that's actually faded to a significant degree um, because one can have a, a base of support that can hold up in, in, in spite of certain kinds of scandals. You put those two things together and it's a toxic recipe. Um, and it's the type of thing where um, the solutions that I've seen talked about, for example, that one could go to a subscription type of model where people would pay for content. 
that's incredibly expensive, and there's no, there's no reason to expect it, and most people are willing to actually pay significant amounts of money for content. It's one thing in the old days, if you're the New York world and, you're, and your, your clientele was paying literally a penny for a newspaper, and you even get on Sundays, you know, nice multicolor uh, comics and so forth. It's quite another thing if we now find ourselves in a situation whereby people have to cough up perhaps 20, 30, 40 dollars a year. The evidence so far is that while people are willing to cough this up, the number of people is relatively limited. And what that means is that, especially for the local newspaper reporting and local media reporting, it's just not clear that in most localities, in most places around the world, people will be willing to do that. So again, I'm sorry, I'm just extremely pessimistic about this, but I don't really see a way out of this uh, for the moment there. I can see bits and pieces of assistance, but not, nothing that really solves it as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, so, uh, Prof Professor Sullivan, I'd like to uh, ask you a question then, because you mentioned uh, the lack of shock over scandalous behavior, for instance, and um, I thought we could maybe get back to the attacks on journalists, but I was wondering if you could maybe say what impact you think U.S. President Donald Trump's uh, constant attacks on the media, um, which he constantly describes as the enemy of the people, a term used by Stalin, um, has on democracy in the U.S., and also, but also on governments around the world. Well, the, the one word answer is bad. <laughs> okay. It's a Trump type of answer. Bad, capital B-A-D. Um, but the, the multi-word answer is that um, uh, it's, it's definitely something that's enabling. There is at this point the equivalent, I, I'm old enough to remember the idea of a so-called fourth as well as a third international. This is like a fifth international at this point. Um, and you actually have uh, a kind of mutual assistance society in which, in which um, flagrant violations of what used to be considered standard norms of not only protection of journalism, but of ordinary ways of treating the press and so forth have flown out the window um, and in which there is apparently no, um, uh, no sanctioning about it. Um, I would add parenthetically, I'm not sure when Trump uses enemy of the people, he necessarily has read Stalin. I'm quite sure he hasn't read Ibsen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, so, uh, Christoph, I was also wondering if you could maybe um, comment on a few, uh, bring up some of the specific cases. I mean, there have been some quite shocking cases uh, recently. And, you know, we're thinking about um, the fact that I was talking to some colleagues here who were pointing out that when you're on the ground uh, in conflict areas now, it's better to avoid the big press signs, I mean, because it's basically having a target on your back when they used to guarantee safety for journalists. So uh, there seems to be, have been this very dramatic uh, shift in the attitudes towards journalists. So maybe you have some of the specific examples to share with us. In fact, the politicians who um, express hate, hate against journalists, they, they, they take a huge responsibility because they consider it's it can be uh, very successful on, a, on a, an electoral basis, but in fact, they really create the conditions of the weakening of journalism. And if they are not directly um, guilty when journalists are killed, they are responsible. Trump in, uh, uh, really um, spoke, as, as you said, against journalists, and last year, for the first time, I think, in the American history, four journalists were killed in Annapolis, Maryland, when a guy entered the newsroom with a gun because he was, um, there was an article about him six years ago. In the past six years, he insulted journalists on the social networks, on Twitter, and then decided to enter the newsroom and kill um, four people uh, in the capital Gazette. In Slovakia, in Europe, the prime minister insulted journalists many, many times. And he could say, I'm not directly guilty of the assassination of Jan Kusiak and his wife. But in fact, he also created the conditions. And unfortunately, we see it more and more from the Philippines, to India, to Latin American countries. And so we all have to defend not the media industry, 
not specific interests, but really the capacity of journalists to, to investigate things that are really useful for all of us. And, and uh, as uh, Antonio Guterres said, the most sensitive topics are in fact the most important topics for mankind. Okay. Environment, <coughs> corruption, human rights, etc. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time, uh, so I was, I've been asked to take some questions from the floor, and I'll give you a word in just a second. But we want to have time for some questions from the floor. Um, so I'd ask everyone, uh, anyone who asked a question, to present yourself and not uh, make too long statements, please, because we don't have too much time. Um, so, yeah, I see the gentleman in the middle there. Yes, um, thank you very much. My name is George Paparados. I'm the head of mission and permanent observer of the European Public Law Organization. Um, Mr. Gelou at one point said that uh, journalists at one point in time, they had monopoly of information. I, I'm willing to challenge this uh, because you have constantly relied on governments for information from areas that you could not access. In other words, you were fed in biased information in the sense that the governments will choose what they wanted to give you. And you were going ahead and publish it in the newspapers. So um, I, you know, I kind of, I'm not here to defend governments, but all I'm saying is that there has been this type of interaction uh, and also in areas that uh, sometimes journalists don't bother to investigate. They just take the press release and put it in the, in the newspaper. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to well, comment on that? Yeah. Well, uh, very quickly, I, I spoke about the former world when I said they, they had a sort of monopoly. Of course, they do not have it anymore. And possibly it's very good, in fact. But, but what we have to, to, to secure and when I say we, is it's all the citizens. Uh, it's how can we get in our societies trusted third parties to get reliable information? Are they journalists or are they citizens? In fact, that's not the main question. The main question is how do we succeed to, to, to secure our, the right that we have to um, uh, reliable information in order not to be manipulated. And of course, journalists in many countries are also uh, accomplices of governments or, or sometimes they can do bad work. Uh, I, nobody would say that they are perfect. It wouldn't make sense. The question is, how do we get uh, good news and information? And when I say good, I mean reliable, of course. Anyone else? If I can just add as a, as a, as a footnote, one of the things I, I mentioned, there are a number of sources of restrictions on press freedom. And one of those sources is exactly by the criminalization of what had been a standard practice, namely leaks. And for those of you, or maybe I should say for those of us who would like to imagine that what we have now is, I kind of, in the United States, is a nightmare come to life. Um, I would point out that uh, the current president's predecessor, whom I think is in almost every conceivable respect infinitely better, um, actually led led the um, through more had had more more prosecutions uh, for leaks than all of his predecessors in the 200 some odd years of U.S. history combined. So it strikes me that this is the type of thing where by the the kind of moment that Christoph was referring to that we lived that moment is gone, and it's not coming back. And if I, no? Okay. And uh, there was uh, someone in the middle there also, and I see a journalist over there. My name is Maurice Chocin. I'm an attorney, Swiss in California. I want to first uh, congratulate you for your fantastic job. I want to throw a stone in our pond. What good is it to have a good press if the vast majority doesn't care? Let me tell you, uh, take two, three examples. Brexit, 
We all know that the vote two and a half years, three years ago was a fake, had been manipulated, Cambridge Analytica and so on. We all know that if it were to come back to vote, there would be 62% of people opposing Brexit. But there is no vote again. So we are informed, but we don't take the consequences. Take another example. I am from the generation that stopped in the street the Vietnam War. Why in our youth generation now do we have nobody to stand for stopping the current wars? Why, the third example, are our young people not interested in reading good press? In the majority. <laughs> okay. I mean, the question is, how do we reinstate true interest? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, there's one. Uh, we're gonna take. Uh, anyone? Does anyone feel like uh, addressing that? No, no. <laughs> no. Uh, Sorry, I, I will try to answer this question. I, I wouldn't say that the young people are not interested. In fact, <laughs> they are probably not interested on, that's also the case, I think, for other generations, in the same things. Probably due to the huge amount of news and information, people are less interested now in the same events. But if you have a look, there are a lot of topics that are really in-depth topics about treaties, international conventions, negotiations, etc. About sometimes structural questions. Less about the elections, less about political parties, but more about other topics that people want to understand. And probably we, we can also consider that journalists have to make an effort to adapt to this. But, um, and the question is, of course, that the, the potential or the capacity to manipulate is very high. And that just the rules were lost. We lost our rules. That's not the mistake of a generation. That's just due to the new technologies. Our rules were not perfect. The world was not perfect. There were a lot of influences through money, politics, power, etc. So let's find good rules for today. Thank you. And, yeah. um, I, I think one of the challenges that we have with this conversation is that we're trying to separate off, and I agree there are very fundamental economic and other questions relating to the, the industry and the, the purveyance of, of news as a business. But the reality is this, these issues of, of access to information, free information, online content, journalism, all connect up with the broader range of issues that, that we're facing as societies relating to you know, how, what is the relationship between people and their government? How do we allow all actors, human rights defenders? I mean, I find it really interesting when we talk about the journalists that are under threat are the ones that are researching corruption and, and you know, human rights. Well. On our side, on the human rights side, we see that the people that are under the greatest threat are those that are looking at you know, challenges like environment and land rights and indigenous issues and LGBTI. And so the same forces that are closing the space for those people to do their work are the same that want to close off the space for journalism. We won't find solutions if we bifurcate these issues and sort of look at the threats to journalism without looking at that broader threat, I think, of where is the space for uh, people in general to interact with their governments and how are they doing it? And you know, what models have we set? The question earlier about what models are being set by attacks on press. Well, we had the same issue, of course, with the, the proliferation of legislation that closes down the ability of associations of, of individuals, of people to do this very important work of engaging on public policy issues vis-a-vis -vis their governments. 
So to me, you know, we have to connect up these issues to the broader space. And fortunately, and I will get back to the question, that brings us back to the youth and, and younger people. There are incredibly you know, powerful new movements of people that are active on issues like climate change. We've seen you know, students walk out of school on, on climate change. So we, we do just need to find, as Christoph has said, different ways of engaging with those audiences rather than sort of looking at what has worked and what hasn't. Mr. Sylvan, did you want to say anything? No. To that? No, okay. So I'm, I, no, okay. I have, sorry, I have one last, time for one last question, and I'm going to give it to a journalist and an ACNU member, uh, Gabriela Sotomayor. I'd like to get a question. Yeah, I, just a second. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, congratulations for the 70th anniversary. I'm a ACNU member as well. I'm a Mexican journalist, and I, my question is, how to protect journalists. For example, in Mexico, uh, 17 were killed last year. In Mexico, uh, there is a mechanism to protect, to protect journalists, and some of the journalists that were killed were protected by that mechanism. So how to protect journalists? That is my question. Thank you. So the question of, of the implementation of international law is key. Is key. Um, that's why we do consider that a special representative to the UN Secretary General should be appointed on this question to really, uh, so that the member states of the UN have to face their obligations according to the international law. And the fight against impunity is something we can quote the figures in thousands of conferences. The question is, how do we exercise pressure? How do we damage the image of those who do not defend journalists or even our press freedom predators? How do we raise the cost, the cost for um, those uh, who violate the rights of journalists? And regarding the situation of Mexico, and Mexico is not a country at war. It is not supposed to be. But in fact, every year, around 10 journalists are killed. They are sometimes dismantled. What happened in the consulate in Istanbul uh, with the Saudi Arabian journalist, Khashoggi, happens very often in Mexico. Not through public agents, but social, but so sometimes uh, of course, they are killed by drug traffickers or by politicians who are connected with drug traffickers. So it's really important to exercise pressure on governments. And um, there is a new president now in Mexico. Uh, I should go to Mexico in the next few days to, to meet with him, to, to deal with this question. And uh, we hope that the policy will change. But I will just give you an example. Two years ago, I went to Mexico, and Mexico is a country where there are huge buildings with people who are in charge of the protection of human rights defenders and journalists. It's a huge bureaucracy. Everybody coordinates the whole day. <laughs> and I met with the special prosecutor. He's in charge. He was, because after he left. He was in charge, 100% of his week, on this. And I said, in six years, how many cases did you uh, solve? How many people were sentenced? He said, uh, there was only one case. And I said, could you tell me the name of the victim? Or the guilty person? He said, I do not remember. <laughs> so we have to exercise pressure on those guys. Can I come in on that as well? I mean, I think Christoph has made a, a, an incredibly powerful point about the fact that the mechanisms that we have aren't working. But at the same time, you've also showed us that we do know what's happening. The reality is we know about those cases. Those cases are, you know, groups like Reporters on Frontier and others are a committee to protect journalists, very active in Mexico, are doing amazing work. Um, but they don't, you know, despite that, um, it, you know, we haven't gotten the impunity to be addressed. And so I do think we have to look at these broader issues of what does it mean, and the fact that the Khashoggi case had the enormous attention it did, yet the other cases of journalists 
who, as, as you've said, are, are equally you know, appalling, and the case of, of journalists detained, even in the country that uh, some of these things have happened in, you know, we have to be able to look at the, the cases across that spectrum, and that's why I do think that with the mechanisms we have, the freedom of expression, Special Rapporteur has done amazing work on this, we have the information, what we need to do now is move on to government action. And how we get that to happen, I think, is by linking up and making more public movements, making more actions around this, making the Khashoggi case not be the only one everybody talks about. If, if I could just say, when you get countervailing action, it's because in a particular country, there are counter elites, there are people who are opposed, who have actually some resources at their disposal to the, to the state, um, would-be elites, for example, who are actually able and have a vested interest to act contrary to that. Um, the, what I see is that the vast majority of countries where the, the largest uh, levels of violence against journalists are, there are no significant um, counter elites. Um, and you can see this in spades. You can see it flagrantly in the Khashoggi case. Okay, because in the end, there was some bad press. There still is bad press. There will be some votes, some of them symbolic, some slightly less than symbolic, but nothing is actually going to change unless such time, which I don't expect to happen anytime soon, of some kind of countervailing elites actually in the country concerned, namely Saudi Arabia, or in some of the countries that enable Saudi Arabia, and I'm thinking in this particular case, obviously, of the United States, and so far that's not actually happening. So I, again, am very, very pessimistic, not because I think that the idea of pressure is not, not a good one, I think it's a wonderful one, it's just that the idea only works if it's related, there's a kind of conveyor belt. And what you have, in effect, is something that's really, really broken now. The equivalent, the functional equivalent in lots of countries of, let's say, concurrent or, or, or actually competitive elites in a kind of Madisonian sense is actually disappearing to a great degree. And that's a very fundamental problem because without that, there's nobody who actually can push back or is willing to push back there. And so what so-called civil society can do is one thing, but there have to be people with power or, or especially with money who can actually be mobilized. And that's becoming less and less prevalent. Just take a look, finally, Zuckerberg's name was taken in vain, but take a look more generally at the way in which various of the really large tech companies in Silicon Valley and so forth have actually made their peace with all kinds of authoritarian regimes, all kinds of censorship, and the number one example obviously would be China. I remember really fine words a few years ago, and that's all gone by, going by the wayside right now. Okay, thanks. So I, I think that we, we are running out of time here. Um, so I think we're just going to have to wrap it up. <laughs> no, I think you're going to have to take it later, John, because we're, because we're out of time. So I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I'd like to thank our panelists, really, for uh, taking part in this and uh, for a very interesting conversation on a very important topic. So thank you so much for coming. Yep. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laurent Siro, and I'm the vice president of uh, ACANU. So thank you once again to the, to the panelists. Now it's time uh, for us to move into the last part of our evening, which is the first ACANU Awards ceremony. These are prizes that were launched in the framework of our 70th anniversary. And we pretty hope it's going to become a regular melody in the annual heat parade. But for that first year, we have to say we're really happy with the uh, first edition. And uh, that was thanks to many stakeholders. And let me just briefly uh, thank uh, among them the, the members of our international and independent uh, jury. We have four members of the jury with us tonight in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, we have first the Secretary General of the International Federation of Journalists, Anthony Belanger. Thank you, Anthony. Applause 
Then we have the special uh, advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations for the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Dieng. Where are you, Adama? Then we have the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and Nobel Peace Prize winning organization 2017, Beatrice Finn. Where is she? Okay. And last but not least, the professor of journalism at Ashoka University in India, uh, Vaiju Naravane. And also very Briefly, a big thank you as well to the two members that couldn't make it uh, tonight. First, the former president of uh, the Swiss Confederation and now a regular author, Didier Burkhalter. And, uh, and the, um, the award-winning American journalist and professor at Columbia School of Journalism, Anne Cooper. Thank you for them. But now it's time to honor our laureates. So for that, I call Nina again on the stage. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Uh, hello again. <laughs> um, so we've reached the evening's final segment, the very first ACNU Award Ceremony. Um, and uh, we created these two new international journalism prizes as part of our 70th anniversary celebrations. I think in light of the discussion that we've just had uh, on growing hostility towards journalists and the media in general, it is essential to really highlight high quality journalistic work that contributes to our knowledge and our understanding uh, of the world we live in. So ACNI was especially keen to shine a spotlight on outstanding coverage of the UN agencies and international organizations based here in Geneva. Um, the ACNI Prize for Excellence in Reporting was created for that purpose. Any coverage of work done by Geneva-based organizations, ranging from refugees to health to trade uh, to climate change, was uh, eligible for consideration. And since Geneva is seen as the home for human rights work with the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Human Rights Council based here, we decided to create two separate, uh, to create, sorry, one separate prize focused on the coverage of human rights issues. Um, and Laurent just mentioned our very impressive independent international jury um, whose members did a fantastic job of th going through dozens of excellent articles uh, on a vast array of topics uh, by journalists from all around the world. The competition was very fierce and a number of ACNU's own members also submitted their work including several articles that were in the final running for the prizes. In the end, the two articles chosen by the jury both touched on the dangers faced by migrants attempting uh, journeys made more perilous by the diplom diplomatic wrangling of states. Both were hailed for their in-depth reporting and the quality of writing in describing the tragedies and abuses that befall irregular migrants. I'm going to announce the prizes. <laughs> 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 but I can announce them anyway. Um, so, <laughs> I hope they're coming. Um, in the excellence in reporting category for distinguished coverage of work done by United Nations agencies and international organizations based in Geneva, the Independent International ACNU Awards Jury selected an article written by British freelancer uh, Jennifer O'Mahony. Jennifer, can you come up? So, I promise you're going to get a prize. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. Uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to introduce it first, sorry. Um, so, um, the article, which was published in The Telegraph on June 25, 2018, and entitled Algeria Dumps Thousands of Migrants in the Sahara Amid EU-Funded Crackdown, describes in stark detail the dangers faced by migrants sent by Algerian authorities to fend for themselves in the Sahara Desert. The jury emphasized the or originality of the angle that O'Mahony chose for her in-depth and her in-depth reporting and compelling writing. 
the article which touches on efforts of Geneva-based United Nations organizations uh, that work with migrants and refugees, so uh, IOM and UNHCR, also raises questions about what responsibility Europe bears for the cruel and sometimes deadly immigration policies implemented by Algeria and others to stem the flow of migrants to the continent. It's really quite a lovely and heart-wrenching piece, and I encourage you all to read it. Do we have that? <laughs> This is the first part. So this is the first part. Congratulations. Thank you. And we're going to go to the second part. And also, excuse me. Yes. There we go. And so, congratulations. Uh, the first ever ACNU uh, Award for Excellence in Reporting. Would yeah, you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to thank our esteemed jury for this award and to Nina and all her colleagues at the UN Correspondents Association for organizing this wonderful event and um, the prize. Um, I quit a stable job or a stable a job as journalism can offer in April last year in order to write stories I felt were going missing or were told too superficially in West Africa, where I've lived now for three years. In some parts of the region where I work, the UN remains the only way that journalists can travel to conflict zones and remote areas and also to access certain sources. I know journalists can be annoying and that we take up a fair amount of your time but I would like to say to those of you working in the UN, please keep letting us in. The story of Niger and the Sahel region as a whole represents one of the greatest long-term threats to Africa and Europe's stability, and few people are telling it. The so-called migration crisis in sub-Saharan Africa is not driven primarily by conflict, but is largely due, due to unequal distribution of wealth and huge youth unemployment. Additionally, when climate change pushes people from their land, when food disappears, and when states can no longer sustain their populations, what happens? Those people move. As I reported when they travel through Algeria, they now risk their lives, as the rhetoric of Europe on African migration has emboldened the authorities to round up migrants, beat and rob them, and then dump them in the Sahara Desert, 25,000 people were expelled across the border into Niger last year, some of them just babies. I interviewed Guineans, Ivorians, Liberians, and Nigerians in Niger, and their stories all brought me back to one difficult truth about how they're treated. Without the resources from their countries and the others around them, the neighboring nations, there would be no aluminum cans, no Swiss chocolates, no rubber tires for your car, no diamond rings, no iPhones, and the lights would turn off in France, which is powered by uranium from Niger. European governments seem adamant that these young people have nothing to offer, but we are already benefiting from the resources that could actually sustain them at home, while doing little to stop their environment being destroyed. It is a journalist's job not only to report the facts, but also the inconsistencies and with that, I hope the UN will remain a partner in reporting uncomfortable truths in difficult to reach places. I just want to add a final word of thanks to my photographer, uh, Chamo Yeros, who also happens to be my husband, who couldn't be there today. <laughs> and um, to my editor, Jessica Winch at the Daily Telegraph for believing in the story. And um, we've spoken a little bit about local journalists. I'd also like to thank two fixers who really made this story possible. Um, Omar Hamasali and Adam Musa, who, who both live in Niger. So with that, uh, thank you again and good night. Et nous passons maintenant à la seconde catégorie, le prix à Canu pour la meilleure couverture journalistique des droits de l'homme. Nous sommes très heureux de pouvoir remettre le prix non pas à un ou une journaliste, mais à deux journalistes qui ont travaillé ensemble. 
Et je le fais en français parce qu'il se trouve que le jury international a désigné deux journalistes Genevois pour ce, cette première édition de, de ce prix-là. Donc j'ai le plaisir d'appeler Adria budry carbo du journal Le Temps et Camille Pagella de l'Illustré. L'article qui s'appelle « Piège en haute mer » a été publié le 25 mars 2018 dans le temps, après deux semaines passées par nos deux lauréats sur le bateau de sauvetage Aquarius en Méditerranée. Le jury a souligné le reportage profond et original, de même que la qualité de l'écriture et le récit fort, avec des personnages très développés et une mise en scène dramatique qui rappelle des fictions criminelles. L'article décrit au travers des yeux de, des sauveteurs le désespoir de ceux qui tentent la traversée dangereuse. Il relaie avec de nombreux détails les décisions auxquelles sont confrontés les sauveteurs et leur frustration lorsque des manœuvres politiques les contraignent à tourner le dos à des personnes dans le besoin. Un très bon article, selon le jury, accompagné de photos et de vidéos de qualité tout aussi élevée. Bravo à vous deux Bravo, et je ne sais pas lequel d'entre vous veut parler. Alors, on s'est mis d'abord avec moi. Monsieur <rire> Bon. Euh, on, on a passé trois semaines à bord d'un bateau avec 30 personnes, donc on a une longue liste de, de remerciements. Donc, euh, non, je réalise que vous n'êtes pas forcément là pour m'écouter ou, ou vous ne parlez pas forcément français. Donc, euh, on, va les, on va les regrouper par catégorie. Euh, bah, tout d'abord, dire merci euh, aux sauveteurs et au personnel médical de l'Aquarius euh, et, au, et aux marins. Ça fait donc un, une trentaine de personnes. Euh, dire merci à tous les gens qui ont voulu partager leur, leur histoire avec nous. Merci euh, au, au, à la Canou et à tous les membres du jury. Et puis surtout, euh, ne pas oublier de remercier nos deux rédactions, celle du temps et celle illustré, les chefs et les petits chefs qui nous ont permis de partir trois semaines, qui nous permet, ce qui est aujourd'hui euh, un privilège euh, de, de passer autant de temps sur un, un sujet comme ça. Mais euh, en tout cas, on a eu beaucoup de plaisir à le faire. Avant de, de passer la parole à, à Camille et sur une note un, plus per, un peu plus personnelle, euh, sur l'Aquarius, j'ai beaucoup pensé à mon grand-père. Euh, je ne sais pas vraiment pourquoi, mais c'est des choses qui revenaient. Euh, des images comme ça qui revenaient, parce que mon grand-père, il n'a pas, pas migré, il n'a jamais eu besoin de prendre un bateau pour, euh, pour aller dans un autre pays, pour quitter le sien. Euh, mais j'ai quand même toujours été très fier de mon grand-père. Quand il avait 16 ans, le gouvernement espagnol lui a demandé euh, d'aller combattre le fascisme euh, en, en 1936. Euh, pardon. Je, comme vous voyez, j'ai eu le temps d'écrire mon discours, mais je n'ai pas eu le temps de l'apprendre. Mais, mais ça va venir. Euh, avec lui, donc, euh, ils, étaient environ, enfin, ils étaient 30 000 personnes. Euh, et puis, c'est dans ce qu'on a appelé le bataillon du biberon, euh, à, combattre, euh, à combattre principalement entre la, la Catalogne et, et, et Aragon. Euh, et puis moi, j'étais encore plus fier de mon grand-père républicain. Mais lui, il n'aimait pas trop parler de la guerre. Euh, il était un peu bourru, euh, il économisait jusqu'à ses propres mots. Euh, mais trois ans avant sa mort, en, en, en 2014, il a accepté de rouvrir les anciennes blessures parce que son petit-fils avait 16 ans, comme lui quand il a fait la guerre, et parce que son petit-fils faisait son travail de maturité. Euh, il avait décidé de faire son travail de maturité sur la, la guerre civile espagnole. Alors on a mangé ensemble tous les midis pendant trois semaines. Au restaurant, euh, lui, il narrait son histoire et, et moi, ben, je faisais le journaliste. Et euh, à ce moment-là, ben, en fait, c'est le meilleur été que j'ai passé avec lui. Et euh, j'ai compris à ce moment-là qu'en fait, mon grand-père, il n'était pas républicain. Euh, C'était juste un gamin de la campagne qui est né dans un pays en guerre en Europe occidentale. Et c'était il n'y a pas très longtemps. 
j'ai aussi appris euh, que mon, que mon grand-père avait survécu à la, à la sanglante bataille de l'Ebre parce qu'il n'avait pas traversé le fleuve. La faute à, à son commandant qui avait euh, contrevenu l'ordre de, de l'état-major républicain. Et si je vous raconte tout ça ce soir, c'est parce que l'histoire a une fâcheuse tendance à se répéter et que l'aventure humaine consiste encore trop souvent à traverser des fleuves, des mers ou des frontières au péril de sa vie. Alors ce soir, j'aimerais avoir une pensée pour lui et pour ma mère qui ne sont plus là pour m'accompagner, et surtout pour tous ceux qui sont nés du mauvais côté de la vie. Bonsoir. Euh, L'Aquarius était pour les migrants ce que j'appellerais un sas de décompression, une pause et un soulagement dans un voyage périlleux. La côte libyenne avait disparu de l'horizon et dans 48 heures tout au plus, euh, c'est celle de Schengen que nous verrons. En Méditerranée, là-bas, dans les eaux internationales, il n'y a pas de droit. C'est le plus fort qui fait la loi. Ils le savaient quand ils ont quitté la Libye sur leur bateau pneumatique, moi un peu moins, lorsque j'ai embarqué sur l'Aquarius pour notre portage en avril 2018. Je suis prêt à mourir en mer plutôt que de retourner en Libye, m'ont dit plusieurs personnes qui venaient d'être sauvées. Alors, lorsqu'ils rejoignaient la coque orange de l'Aquarius, ils savaient qu'ils ne mourraient pas aujourd'hui. Sur l'Aquarius, les passagers avaient le droit de rêver. « Qu'est-ce que j'ai hâte d'arriver en Europe pour travailler ?» m'a dit un jour Elias, un passager bengalais. Je lui ai retourné son sourire et j'ai essayé de ne pas penser trop fort à la réalité qui l'attendait. Après, après la violence de la Libye, avant de faire face euh, à celle de, des lois européennes, je retiens leur rire, leur danse, leur chant, des heures durant, au son de l'accordéon d'Aloïs, le chef de mission de MSF. Ce n'est pas la seule chose que je retiens. Pour moi aussi, ce voyage en haute mer était un moment hors du temps. J'ai rencontré des gens extraordinaires, des sauveteurs, des migrants ou des infirmiers, dont l'abnégation et le courage se rencontrent au milieu de la Méditerranée. Penser à eux aujourd'hui me donne l'envie de convaincre mes chefs de repartir pour d'autres aventures. J'aimerais dédier ce prix aux personnes qui m'ont formé en Grèce. Il y a tout juste trois ans, je commençais le métier de journaliste à Athènes, au bureau de l'agence France Presse, au moment où la route des Balkans fermait et où des centaines de milliers de personnes se sont retrouvées piégées en Grèce. On connaît leurs initiales à ces agenciers, mais ils s'appellent Odile Dupéry, Catherine Boitard, Hélène Colliopoulou ou John Adoulis. Ils m'ont mis le pied à l'étrier, m'ont fait une confiance aveugle, et m'ont appris bien plus qu'ils ne l'imaginent. Nous sommes très honorés d'avoir reçu ce prix. Merci à la Canou de l'avoir organisé. Merci aux membres du jury d'avoir choisi notre travail. Et merci aux sauveteurs de l'Aquarius. Again, um, and I would also like to point out uh, to the gentleman in the middle here that our, our three uh, laureates are 30 or younger, so I think it bodes well for the quality of journalism to come. There. <laughs> And um, as I was saying, I would like to thank again the Graduate Institute uh, for hosting this event and the Swiss National Cantonal and Municipal Authorities uh, for their generous financial support and also to uh, Karen Dash for providing us with the, the lovely engraved pens that make up part of the prize. And a huge thank you to all of you for coming out uh, to this event and I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you.